Matthew 5, verse 33. This is our Messiah speaking. He says, again, you have heard that it was said to our ancestors, you must not break your oath, but you must keep your oaths to Yahweh. But I tell you, don't take an oath at all, neither by heaven, because it is the Almighty's throne, or by the earth, because it is His footstool, or by Jerusalem, because it is the city of the great King. Neither should you swear by your head, because you cannot make a single hair, white or black. But let your word yes be yes, and your no be no. Anything more than this is from the evil one. And Yahweh bless His word to our hearts today. Almighty Yahweh in heaven, thank you so much for loving us. Thank you for sending us your word. Thank you for teaching us through your scriptures. Thank you for not leaving us in the dark. We glorify you and we praise you. Help us to have a good understanding on this text and many others when we leave here today. And I pray that these lessons will be a blessing to the people and a great encouragement and education as well. I pray all these things to you through your Son, Yeshua, our Messiah. Amen. So today, we're going to begin to look at verses uh, in the Bible about oaths and oath-taking. We're going to look at the verses that we just read in Matthew 5. To many Christians today, this section of the Bible is clear and it needs to just be read at face value and followed. And of course, I believe in reading it as I do any of the texts in the Bible. I believe in believing it and I believe in following it. Um, but I also believe that there are many people who have misinterpreted this section in the Sermon on the Mount for various reasons. I believe the Sermon on the Mount gets grossly misinterpreted due to the lack of foundational knowledge, understanding, and teaching in the law of Moses and the Older Testament period. So there are Christians that believe that these verses teach that we should never take an oath. This was very popular in the Anabaptist movement out of the Protestant Reformation. Uh, this is popular with some Baptists and Pentecostals today. Uh, some people would say that we should never even swear to tell the truth in a court of law. I had a pastor of mine when I was growing up as a teenager, and he told me that he once resigned from a particular group because that group was going to require him to take an oath of entry. And he told me that the Lord said in Matthew 5, verse 34, swear not at all, so I'm not going to be able to join that group. On the other hand, on the other side, there are some people that I have come across in my walk in ministry who are against the New Testament completely, and they're against Yeshua as the promised Messiah. They believe that Yeshua was a false teacher based on statements like this in the Sermon on the Mount. I had a fellow tell me last year that the man from Nazareth could not be the Messiah because he contradicted the Torah. And this fellow told me that the Torah said to take oaths, but the man from Nazareth said, do not take oaths at all. And so this fellow rejected Yeshua as the Messiah. So you've got both extreme positions, and I think that both positions are insufficient. One of them stems from ignoring the Older Testament, specifically the Law of Moses, and the other position stems from ignoring some of the cultural context in the times of Yeshua. So we need to always remember that we'll get into trouble in Bible interpretation by one, ignoring context, that's a huge one, and two, not taking into account everything that the Bible has to say. That's what happens here, and it happens in a host of other verses and subjects in the Newer Testament. People will quote things like, eat whatever is set before you, asking no question for conscience sake, or one that I heard today, the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. And they'll quote things like that. And this message is not about the dietary laws, but I'm making a point 
is that people oftentimes will quote things in the New Testament, one-liners, and they will expect you to believe that sentence by itself without any context, whether in the Bible, in the literature of the Bible, or in the culture of that time. And when you try to explain to them what a text means from more study, more context, and more Bible verses, oftentimes people will get mad and say that you're trying to get around what it says. And that mentality stems from a shallow reading of the Bible. It is an easy way to arrive at false doctrine. And this is what I believe happens here with the verses about taking oaths. It's not that our Messiah's words are wrong. Our Messiah's words are 100% right. It's simply that people do not spend enough time studying our Messiah's words and the Hebraic context in which he spoke them. They read a verse, they interpret it with a 21st century mind, and they kind of just run wild with a wrong interpretation and condemn everybody that doesn't follow through with that understanding. But it's not that our Messiah's words are wrong. It's not that what he says should not be believed and followed. It should. But the issue is, is that there is much more to read on this subject elsewhere in the Bible. And to ignore everything that came before this text, before we get to Matthew chapter 5, to just ignore what's at the front of the book, is not doing justice with the Scriptures, and to ignore the Holy Scriptures in totality, all of them, will lead to lopsided and bad doctrine. We don't want to do that. When we interpret Scripture, we cannot go to just one verse. We have to go with the totality of the Bible. We have to realize that some parts hold more weight than other parts. It's not that some verses matter and other verses don't matter. It's just that some verses are commandments. Some verses are, thus saith Yahweh. Some verses are more black and white than others. So our goal should not be to dismiss anything, but it should be to properly interpret and exegete each text in its context. And then when we look at all of the texts, the more we study, we can harmonize them all together and come to an understanding and say, oh, okay, now I fully get what this text and that text and this text over here and that text back there is saying and is meaning as a whole. And they sing this beautiful, harmonious song together when we do that. So when it comes to oath-taking, swearing oaths, does the Bible have anything else to say other than what we opened up with in Matthew 5, 33 through 37? You bet. The Bible has loads to say on this subject. And we're going to begin with Exodus 22, verses 10 through 13, and then we'll branch out to a few more texts in the Law of Moses explaining this. Exodus 22, beginning at verse 10. When a man gives his neighbor a donkey, an ox, a sheep, or any other animal to care for, but it dies, is injured, or is stolen while no one is watching. Verse 11, there must be an oath before Yahweh between the two of them to determine whether or not he has taken his neighbor's property. Its owner must accept the oath, and the other man does not have to make restitution. But if, in fact, the animal was stolen from his custody, he must make restitution to its owner. If it was actually torn apart by a wild animal, he is to bring it as evidence. He does not have to make restitution for the torn carcass. So here in the law of Yahweh, given through the mouth of Moses, we have a required oath, not an optional oath, but a required oath between two brothers assuring the owner that the person caring for the animal was innocent in the loss of that animal. Of course, if the person that cares for the animal is found guilty of theft, what happens? Restitution. You have to pay back so many fold depending on the situation. What the oath did was place a person under either the care of Yahweh, the protection of Yahweh, or the wrath of Yahweh. Either Yahweh would protect the oath taker due to their innocence, or Yahweh would punish them for lying in his name. Now, this is a good time to bring up the third commandment which is primarily about taking oaths or swearing oaths in the name of Yahweh. We read in Exodus chapter 20, verse 7, that we are not to take the name of Yahweh in vain. Now, many of us, including myself, grew up thinking that taking the name of the Lord thy God in vain meant when somebody said 
G-O-D, damn. Um, I'll never forget a conversation I had with a fellow one time. I can't remember where I was at, but we were talking about things of the scriptures, and he said that one of the things that bothered him is when people went around and used the word G-O-D, damn. And he told me, he said, God's last name is not damn. And I didn't think this up before, but it just hit me when he said that. And I remember I told him, I said, you're exactly right. But what a lot of people don't know is that his first name is not God. <laughs> and um, he smiled, and then I had the opportunity to witness to him about the sacred name. Now, I don't believe in going around and saying that. I don't even like it when people use the name Jesus Christ as a curse word. And it's not because I believe that Jesus is the name of the Messiah. It's because I know that they do, and they're using what they think is the name of Christ in a flippant manner. It's the same thing when somebody says, God damn. They're using what they believe is the name of the Creator in a flippant manner. So I don't agree with that practice. I don't go around doing that. But I don't believe that when the commandment was written that Yahweh had that particular thing in mind. I think what He had in mind was taking His name, Yahweh, upon your mouth in the form of an oath or swearing an oath. To take the name of Yahweh in vain had to do with taking the name of Yahweh upon your lips in speech with an oath, but not keeping your oath or lying under oath. The third commandment says Yahweh will not leave a person unpunished or guiltless who taketh his name in vain. Now that helps to make sense out of the oath before Yahweh back in Exodus 22. Remember between the one that lent his animal to be cared for and then the person that was taking care of the man's animal? If a Hebrew swore an oath that he had not done anything wrong towards the animal of his neighbor, he would either, one, he would be innocent and secure under that oath, or two, he would be under the punishment of Yahweh because he violated the third commandment. Now, this is where the idea and the practice, modern day, of swearing to tell the truth in a court of law comes from. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you God. I don't know if they even still say that last part, but I've heard it said like that before. Now, I realize that God is not the Creator's name, but this practice, modern day, stems from taking an oath in the sight of the Creator in His name and thereby being liable for lying under oath. It was understood that after an oath to God Almighty, if you were lying and nobody knew about it, the Almighty would punish you even if man could not punish you. That's the idea of taking an oath in the name of Yahweh. Let's move on to another verse, Numbers 31 through 2. Moses told the leaders of the Israelite tribes, this is what Yahweh has commanded. When a man makes a vow to Yahweh or swears an oath to put himself under an obligation, he must not break his word. He must do whatever he has promised. Again, here we see oath-taking is permissible in the Torah, and we also see that an oath here can be synonymous with a vow. It's a promise that we make to Yahweh, or it's a promise that you're telling the truth in Yahweh's sight. It could be a, a vow or an oath between individuals, or it could be a vow or an oath to the Creator. Here's another one, Deuteronomy 6, 13 through 15. Fear Yahweh, your mighty one, Worship him and take your oaths in his name. Do not follow other mighty ones, the mighty ones of the people around you. For Yahweh, your mighty one, who is among you, is a jealous mighty one. Otherwise, Yahweh, your mighty one, will become angry with you and wipe you off the face of the earth. Now, this one here in Deuteronomy 6 is in commandment form. Fear Yahweh. Take your oaths in his name. And remember the third commandment. Do not take the name of Yahweh, thy mighty one, in vain, right? Here it says, fear Yahweh, worship him, and take your oaths in his name. The point is in the oath that you take, since it is to be done in the name of Yahweh, the highest power in the heavens above and on the earth below, you're either taking the oath in loyalty and devotion to the Creator, or you're taking the oath in vain. You're either upholding the name of Yahweh by what you say is true, or you are blaspheming and falsifying the name of Yahweh by what you say being false. 
Look at Leviticus 19, 11 through 12. This text says, you must not steal. You must not act deceptively or lie to one another. You must not swear falsely by my name, profaning the name of your mighty one. I am Yahweh. So the progression here in this text is it begins with stealing. That's a sin towards your neighbor and then being deceptive and lying to your neighbor. And all of that is wrong. All of that is in violation towards the neighbor, your neighbor who is made in the image and likeness of Yahweh. But then the commandment elevates in verse 12. In verse 12, the commandment elevates to do not swear falsely by the name of Yahweh. In other words, if you lie and you cheat your neighbor, you could then elevate or move on to lie and cheat Almighty Yahweh. You could begin to swear by Yahweh, but you swear falsely by His name because the oath or the words that you speak are not true or you are guilty of profaning the vow or the oath that you made in the sight of Yahweh. And in doing so, you are profaning His name. This is another offshoot of the third commandment about taking His name in vain. Notice the command here in Leviticus 19 is against swearing falsely. Do not swear falsely by my name. The commandment is not do not swear by my name. There's actually a commandment to swear by the name of Yahweh. Deuteronomy 6 verse 13. So it's permissible to swear by Yahweh's name. It's just a sin if we are lying while or after we take that oath or that vow. Let's look at an example of a righteous man in the Bible who swore an oath to another person. Genesis 21, 22 through 24. This is between Abimelech and Abraham, and Abraham makes an oath to Abimelech, the king. At that time, Abimelech, with Phicol, the commander of his army, said to Abraham, The Mighty One is with you in everything you do. Now swear to me here by the Mighty One that you will not break an agreement with me or with my children and descendants. As I have kept faith with you, so you will keep faith with me and with the country where you are a resident alien. And Abraham said, I swear it. Now it must be understood here that even if a person did not speak the name of Yahweh in the oath, any swearing or oath taking in the sight of the Creator was still seen as taking under His banner since He is the Creator of humanity and He is the Creator of all things. Abraham could have spoken the name of Yahweh and it just not be recorded here. Or he could have just simply said, I swear, I take the oath. But it would still be understood that he was swearing by Yahweh. And if you keep reading here in Genesis 21, down in verse 31, it says that they called the name of that place Beersheba because they had swore an oath with each other there. And it had to do with a well that Abraham dug. And Beersheba means the well of an oath, the well that you draw water from. So Beersheba means the well of an oath. They swore an oath to each other there, particularly Abraham to Abimelech. Here is another passage about Abraham where Abraham doesn't take an oath, but he requires for an oath to be swore before Yahweh towards his servant, Eleazar. Genesis 24, verse 1. Abraham was now old, getting on in years, and Yahweh had blessed him in everything. Abraham said to his servant, the elder of his household who managed all he owned, Place your hand under my thigh, and I will have you swear by Yahweh, mighty one of heaven and mighty one of earth, that you will not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I live but will go to my land and my family to take a wife for my son Isaac. Now, a few things here before we continue to read in Genesis 24. First thing is Abraham is asking his servant, I believe when you read the rest of Genesis, his servant, his eldest servant is Eleazar. And he's asking Eleazar to swear an oath to him. And he specifically mentions swearing before Yahweh or swearing by Yahweh, meaning take your oath in the name of Yahweh the mighty one of heaven and earth. There is no higher power than Yahweh. The swearing by Yahweh's name is swearing by his person and holding the servant accountable if the oath is broken. Secondly, 
What does this mean about the hand under the thigh? I read this again this week, and I had looked at this a while back, years ago, and I went ahead and did some more study on this to just verify that I wasn't saying anything incorrectly. But there are two major positions on why the hand was placed under the thigh. Why did Abraham say, place your hand under my thigh and swear by Yahweh? There's another case of this in Genesis, I believe it's verse 47. I don't have this in my notes, or chapter 47. And I think it's where Jacob Israel makes his sons swear by Yahweh, by, and he tells them, put your hand under my thigh and swear by Yahweh that you will take my bones with you when you, when you leave this place. And that's, as far as I know, that's the only two times in the Torah where under the thigh is mentioned. Um, one of the positions says that when you placed your hand under a person's thigh, this is an old Hebrew understanding, old Jewish understanding, it meant that you were acknowledging that they were your superior because they were literally sitting down on your hand. And your hands are what you do your work with. And so when you placed your hand under your thigh, you were acknowledging they were over you. You were swearing an oath to them and you needed to abide by it, not just in the sight of Yahweh, but to keep your word person to person, man to man. So that's one possibility. The other possibility, the other view, which I think is more likely, is that the thigh of Abraham or the thigh of a man is close to the man's circumcision. And circumcision was a covenant sign that was given to Abraham by Yahweh in Genesis 17. And by placing your hand near that sign of the covenant, the man's circumcision, you were acknowledging the Creator and you were acknowledging His commandments, all of them, based upon that sign of the covenant. It is even possible, and some ancient Hebrew interpreters, I believe one of them is even Rashi, states that the thigh is actually a figure of speech or a euphemism for the man's circumcision. So regardless of which view that you take, there is a symbolic meaning going on here, similar to the practice, similar to the practice of somebody placing their hand on the Bible when they take an oath in a court of law. Let's keep reading here in Genesis 24, 5 through 9. So the servant said to Abraham, suppose the woman is unwilling to follow me back to this land. Should I have your son go back to the land you came from? Abraham answered him, make sure that you don't take my son back there. Yahweh, the mighty one of heaven, who took me from my father's house and from my native land, who spoke to me and swore to me, notice, notice that Yahweh swears oaths too. And think about this, when Yahweh swears an oath, who does he swear it by? By himself. There's nobody greater than himself. Hebrews 6 talks about this. Genesis 12 talks about this. But Yahweh swore an oath. And we think, why would Yahweh swear an oath? Because he's the creator. We know he's going to keep his word and keep his promises. I think the reason he swears oaths to men is to give them some kind of reassurance. So Abraham speaks of that Yahweh swore to me uh, about the land. I will give this land to your offspring. He, speaking of Yahweh, he will send his angel before you and you can take a wife for my son from there. If the woman is unwilling to follow you, then you are free from this oath to me. So Abraham puts an out clause in the oath. There's an exception in there. It says if the angel of Yahweh is going to follow you, you're going to prosper. But if the woman that you meet and you think she's for my son, if she doesn't want to come back with you, I won't hold you accountable to the oath. You'll be free from the oath. But don't let my son go back there. So the servant placed his hand under his master Abraham's thigh and swore an oath to him concerning this matter. Now, the main point here is that swearing an oath before Yahweh was an acceptable and was a righteous thing to do. Abraham made Eleazar, his servant, do this for assurance of obedience. Both of them took it seriously. And Eleazar kept this oath to Abraham, and most importantly, he kept this oath to Yahweh because Yahweh was the one he swore by. So we've seen all of this evidence in the Torah, in the law of Yahweh that he gave through the mouth of his servant Moses. Peace and blessings be upon him. And we've seen in Genesis how that Abraham, righteous Abraham, who kept Yahweh's commandments, he took an oath before Abimelech. 
And then we've seen that righteous Abraham required an oath to be taken by Eleazar, his servant, and that they swore in the name of Yahweh. So, what about what the Messiah says in Matthew 5, 34? Where he says, but I tell you, swear not at all. And I've got question mark, question mark, question mark here in my notes. Well, some people say that the Old Testament allowed and commanded oaths in certain cases, but now it's different in the New Testament. That's actually a position that some people take. What was allowed and commanded at one time is now a sin to do in our time. That is the wrong position. I can assure you of that. It's not the correct position. But that is a position that some people take. The Old Testament allowed it, commanded it in some cases, but now that the Messiah has come, it's not allowed. What this position does is not only dismiss the Older Testament, it also dismisses the words of Yeshua earlier in his sermon where he said in verse 17, one of my absolute all-time favorite texts in the Bible, do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I have not come to destroy or to abolish, but to fill them up, to properly interpret, to show you what they mean. So it just ignores that, and it also dismisses the Messiah's life in which he himself all through his life was devoted to the law of Moses and spoke highly of Moses. Um, in passages like Matthew 15 and Mark 7 and Matthew 23, uh, where he talks about the seat of Moses. So Yeshua's entire life was a devotion. He was devout uh, to the instructions, the Torah of Yahweh. Um, so it doesn't make sense that he would come on the scene and undermine or do away with the commandments that we've talked about. So the key here is this. It's, the key here is not that we throw out the Older Testament, and the key here, as the one fellow did last year in my discussion with him, the key is not that we throw out the Sermon on the Mount. The key is that we slow down and we look at everything that the Bible has to say and then after we look at everything, we spend time in meditation and prayer and study and more meditation, more prayer, and more study. And we ask Yahweh to give us the harmony of everything. Even when it looks like texts might on the surface contradict, we ask Yahweh to give us the harmony and the understanding of all of the texts together. Now, I'm going to share with you, as I close this sermon out, I'm going to share with you what I believe the harmony is. And then next week, in next week's lesson, I'm going to give an exegesis of Matthew 5, 33 through 37, verse by verse, and we're, we'll center in on some words in detail as well. The harmony that I believe is this. Taking an oath or swearing in the name of Yahweh is permissible. It's commanded in some cases. It's not always commanded. There is a text at the end of Deuteronomy that says that if you vow a vow to Yahweh, you must fulfill or obey that vow. It's not a sin if you forbear, forbear to vow to Yahweh, but it is a sin if you make a vow or an oath to Him and you don't keep that vow. So in some cases it's permissible but not commanded. In other cases it's commanded, like in Exodus 22 when the man let his neighbor take care of his animal. Yahweh commanded that there be an oath between the two of them in that regard. So oath-taking is permissible and even commanded in some cases, but the scribes and the Pharisees, which are the focal point of the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, verse 20, whose righteousness we must exceed in order to enter the kingdom of heaven. The scribes and the Pharisees had come up with an elaborate system of oath-taking whereby they walked around and they swore oaths for every little thing that they talked about. i never forget one time on the job site we had a fellow that worked. This is when I was young, before I was married. And you could always know when he was lying because every time he would lie before he would start lying, he would say, this is going to be the God's honest truth. <laughs> and, and one of the workers I remember on the job site said, well, here he goes. He's fixing to start lying, y'all. <laughs> but he would feel the need to say, this is the God's honest truth. In other words, this would happen every day, multiple times a day. And the Pharisees had built up this elaborate system of oath taking for every little thing that they did and said. And in doing it, they would purposefully not speak the sacred name when they took their oath. They would swear by heaven. They would swear by earth. 
They would swear by the hair of their beard. They would swear by Jerusalem. They would swear by all of these things, the gold of the temple or the temple. And there was discussions in the Mishnah about if you swore by the temple, you weren't culpable. But if you swore by the gold of the temple, you were. And Yeshua talks about this in Matthew 23, and I'll get to that next week. But they would swear these oaths, and they would never speak the sacred name, and they circumvented the law because if they wanted to get out of the vow or the oath, you know what they would say? Well, it didn't really matter anyhow because I didn't utter the Creator's name. And that was their way to twist the Torah and make oaths without being liable to keep those oaths. And Yeshua, I believe, is teaching us we're not to swear at all like that. Uh, number one, we shouldn't go around having to swear about every little thing we say. We can just let our word be yes and our word be no. Anything more is of the evil one. Number two, if we have cases where the Torah commands us to swear oaths with individuals or if we go before a court of law and we swear an oath, don't think that just because you don't speak the name of Yahweh that he's not the one that will punish you if you break the oath. After all, Jerusalem is the city of the great king. Yahweh made Jerusalem. Heaven is Yahweh's throne. Earth is Yahweh's footstool. The very hairs of your head and beard are numbered by Almighty Yahweh. He knows every single hair of my head. And I can't even fathom how that's possible. Anytime we think that we're bypassing the Creator by swearing by these other things, Yahweh's saying, no, no, no. I created everything. So no matter what you swear by, you're swearing by me. The Pharisees, now nah, they said, no, nah, we're going to do it our way. Yeshua says, better be to not swear at all in that regard. Um, I'll go into this more detail in next week's message, but I think this harmonizes how that we don't have to throw out the Older Testament and also we don't have to throw out the Sermon on the Mount and we can understand it properly instead of having the Messiah contradict the law of Yahweh given through the mouth of Moses. Hallelujah. I'm going to pray and then we'll do our testimony service. Almighty Yahweh, we love you and we thank you and we praise you. You are a great king. Father Yahweh, let us remember that your son told us that we'll be judged by every word that we speak. And Yahweh, help me, help us all, Yahweh, to be more careful of the words that we say. Uh, I pray these things through your son. Amen. Yahweh bless you.